Okay, everyone. Yep, we're ready to go. So uh, today, Marcus uh, has agreed to change a little bit, uh, and we're going to go through a little bit of the reinforcement learning on games, uh, recent headlines, and things of that sort, um, especially looking at OpenAI and the Dota framework. Um, you know, we're, we're going to go through the slides, but uh, there's plenty of other ancillary artifacts and papers that are related to that. So if we have time, we'll take a, a closer look at those as well. Okay. So, yeah, let's start. Okay, thanks. <clears throat> so I, I prepared a um, topic on uh, OpenAI and Dota 2. And um, so what's the main uh, objective of the day is really to understand a bit how the recent advances that have been made in order to play um, multiplayer user games um, have been grounded in um, uh, machine learning advances, both in the supervised uh, neural network space as well as uh, reinforcement learning. Because reinforcement learning alone is not uh, sufficient to really tackle those uh, problems yet. And it's one of the things that uh, we're going to um, look over with today is um, how do we actually combine more traditional um, approaches and reinforcement learning approaches in order to um, now be able to beat um, the best professional teams in Dota 2, which is the most recent achievement that OpenAI shared just five days ago. So April 13, 2019 was the first time that they publicly defeated the world champions in Dota 2 in a 5 versus 5 game. Yeah. And I have a few um, uh, references to that and um, the resources for the presentation or at the end of the slides and some additional stuff will be shared online on Slack. And um, the one thing that I try to do is uh, go through uh, the OpenAI blog in particular and as well as um, the videos that they've shared um, recently uh, where they talk a bit about uh, their advancements and try to put those updates on the slides itself. Because otherwise uh, the thing that has been shared about uh, their approach is um, at least eight months old. I did the last major uh, blog on how they really run OpenAI 5 versus 5. Okay. So, let me just check out, get to the next slide. Okay. So, the first challenge. This um, that I this, I've never played Dota myself before. I'm probably familiar more with the pre predecessor of uh, Dota as well as StarCraft 2 is all about, which is Lord of Warcraft about 20 years ago. And uh, Dota itself is a multiplayer online battle arena game. And um, it's typically played uh, five versus five. So a team of five players uh, plays another team of five players. And the game uh, takes place on the map. As you can see, a sample of the map is on the bottom left-hand side of the slides. And the area in the map is divided into two different areas uh, called Dire and Radiant. And there are three main paths between the two different areas. Um, one going through the center, which is a shortcut, uh, which goes through a river. And then two longer paths, which go on the outside of the map, which uh, go through um, a forest, but don't have to go through a river. So there are different uh, obstacles along the paths. And the main objective of the game is to destroy the enemy uh, buildings as well as uh, the throne, which is usually at the heart of uh, the respective area. Um, what makes this game challenging is that um, it's very complex and has a steep learning curve. So some of the professional players, when they talk uh, online about um, the years it has taken them to get the experience, some of them say it, in order to become really professional the game, they played about eight years. Eight years, yes. And um, so it's, um, it's one thing that we're going to see uh, later on how fast an AI can actually catch up to how an individual player plays the game versus, but then the next challenge was how do we actually play as a team, which uh, uh, created some additional challenges that took them almost two years uh, to master. Okay, uh, so besides the steep learning curve, one of the challenges is that at the beginning of the game, you have to choose uh, which of the 115 plus heroes you actually want to control in the game. Each player controls one hero throughout uh, the gameplay. And um, the heroes, they are all different in terms of um, kind of what abilities they have and how they can uh, move, but uh, kind of how they can cast spells and what kind of talents they have and whether they are strong in attack, defense, and so on and so forth. And um, 
playing five versus five with uh, 115 uh, plus heroes and uh, creates about uh, creates more than a billion um, possible uh, uh, team um, or play, play combinations of five, or five versus five. So that part is quite complex. And what we are going to see in a bit is um, how some of those complexities have been removed uh, in order to build successful AI that can actually play the game. And one of the things where changes have been made is actually uh, on the selection of the heroes. Initially, the selection wasn't part of the game that uh, the, um, the, open, uh, the AI bot could play. And uh, I think now they're currently playing with 17 out of 150 heroes. And uh, some of the challenges that they're currently facing is to actually catch up with the heroes they started to train a couple of years back versus the heroes they're now trying to add on. So the gameplay is um, fighting the enemy team, destroying the enemy buildings, trying to die as little as possible. If you die, you, you have uh, you're removed from the game for a certain number of time, I think 100 to 120 seconds before you can re-enter the game. You have to level up, uh, you have to buy items, kill enemy players um, when possible, and so on. So there's a lot of different dimensions to the game, and it makes building an AI much more complicated than um, some of the things we looked at before, really looking at Atari games or chess or Go. And we're looking at some of those challenges um, in, a, in a bit. The average game time for a game of uh, Dota is about 45 minutes. And there's a lot of different uh, things that you can uh, apply. Um, some of them are highlighted in the, um, on the right-hand side in the video, which uh, just explains a bit uh, how some of the bot behavior has been learned. And we just want to look at the first two, and then I cut the video. If you're interested, I can uh, share the video. It's, the link is below as well. So is this order in terms of uh, the, the when when the, the teams uh, learn that particular? Uh, no, that, I think, uh, don't think that there's a particular order. It's just really to show off some of the complexities uh, that are that are actually in the game. This is from the old old uh, the one eight months back. Or is so this is this uh, this video is from uh, I think June or August two thousand eighteen. Okay. So this is. Um, I think from uh, around the time when they played for the first time publicly a five versus five, mm -hmm. and they actually lost both games. Mm -hmm. yeah. So they do regular press releases and uh, share some of the videos. If you look at the actual YouTube, the video is longer and has a bit of additional commentary from one of the machine learning engineers who was actually involved in building that. Yeah. So, so here, first, the first impression is just to get a bit of an idea what the game looks like. And uh, the second one is a bit more interesting because uh, the second scenario already involves some reinforcement learning and actually displays how some of the rewards are actually being uh, received by, uh, 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 by the AI. Mm -hmm. should, um, become, should come the second part in, uh, in a couple of seconds. Runs a bit slower because I have to. Okay, so value prediction, it actually shows at the bottom uh, left side the actual rewards that the AI gets for achieving a certain objective. So you see um, the reward, the reward curve on the bottom left-hand side going up, the more um, it is able to defeat the hero in the center with the yellow uh, tag. And then in the end, uh, gets a significant reward when it actually lands the kill. So that one is the, the Q value plot, right? That's the Q value over time. Yeah. Um, no, so so that, that's um, a reward it gets for a, a particular action. Okay. So it's the reward plot. Hmm. Yeah. So So both um, Dota and StarCraft 2, which is very similar, which is currently being tackled by uh, Google's uh, DeepMind team, is um, significantly more complex um, than uh, Atari games or the game of uh, Go in many aspects. Um, on top, the, um, the table goes a bit over the information types, um, players, the action space, uh, possible actions that uh, can be taken, as well as a number of moves per game. And in all the categories, Dota and StarCraft are significantly more complex or, 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 or difficult. So it's an imperfect uh, information. 
we don't um, so it's a map based approach where you don't see the entire map at all the time so you cannot observe the entire space uh, it's a multiplayer game you play, usually play five versus five it's a continuous and concrete action space and that um, a lot, uh, more, more or less requires uh, to, to model what you do action uh, um, tick by tick as well as uh, over time so you have to have short term as well as long term uh, strategies and uh, objectives and rewards the possible actions are in the millions and uh, we narrowed it down a bit later on how many actions you have for possible move and that's in the thousands of course not all the uh, possible moves are available at any given point in time it depends a lot on um, where the hero uh, at the given point is and what external uh, circumstances are like at what level the hero is the higher uh, the, um, the uh, hero has leveled up the more um, action of the more moves actually become available and so on and so forth. So below the, the, the diagram, you find uh, five of the key uh, challenges that OpenAI has communicated that they had with uh, this game was what I've done before. It's really having a long time horizon. As I mentioned, the game is roughly played at 45 minutes and um, it's uh, broadcast at 30 frames per second, which makes it uh, 80,000 ticks uh, per game. OpenAI in their current version, they only observe every four frame, so which means they are uh, dealing with about 20,000 ticks uh, for an average game. So 20,000 moves uh, that they actually have to uh, do. They only observe a partial state, or some of the buildings and units can only be seen in the area around the hero, but they cannot observe the dynamic. At least that's uh, some of the constraints in the ideal case, and you will see later on that some of those challenges have been simplified in order to be able to um, get up to speed and be able to play at a professional level faster. So is, is the open AI five agent a single agent that controls all five or are there five different agents? That are so there are five different agents that work together. Okay. So um, I think I have one slide later on in the history. So what happened? So first open AI created one versus one. So they, they just control the single hero and they modify the game so that they're playing uh, against this, uh, just one other hero. And once they achieved that milestone, which took them close to a year, then they uh, launched the uh, OpenAI Fight Initiative and then tried to actually model team play, uh, coordination, and uh, really having a strategy, not individually, but a strategy as a team, which is significantly different in terms of what uh, underlying technologies and uh, models are actually do. It's also ch uh, changed a bit uh, the way they do the important thing. But they don't have an overall um, coordination AI, right? So each of the agents is acting, acting independently and somehow through the reinforcement. Yes. The so, yeah, so, yeah, that, so there's a bit of criticism on how uh, OpenAI cheats, and I have a slide on that one. And one of the things that actually uh, is still under discussion is of how much coordination actually happens on purpose between the agents that is not intuitive to be needs. Right. But um, all the five uh, heroes are controlled individually, mm -hmm. uh, but they have the same observation space. So okay. they, get, they get the same um, they get uh, the input values. So they wouldn't know what the others, uh, what kind of decision the others are making, but there's no active communication. So there's no active have all the observations of the individual yes. agents. Yeah. Okay, so that's it. Yeah. So practically, they can see the concepts of computer that and see what happened. Yes, so they can... Because it's a computer. A yeah. human, maybe, you can see much. I can see yes. Okay. So one thing, and it's on another slide a bit more detailed, that's actually different is, in the past, a lot of the uh, early approach that reinforcement learning was used, the processing is based on the visual representation of the game. So you process big settings. Yeah. This is not the case for Dota and Sparta. Right, they actually have the model being transmitted. Right? So uh, what they are actually doing is they're tapping into the API, mm -hmm. which a lot of people say is it gives them superhuman uh, abilities, which is true to some degree, and it means they have perfect information. So they actually don't have the learning uh, that's involved from translating from the visual representation of the game, like how we look at it, and then uh, trying to figure out what are the values that are of interest. They get the perfect information, they get all the values from the API. And I thought they, they could still have said that different humans see different screens. Right? Yes, I have a snapshot actually how the human sees it versus how the right. AI so they could still have made it such that each AI yes. see a different. Yeah. 
And uh, the reason why OpenAI, yeah, so uh, to this one, visibility, yes. So early on, the visibility was removed. So they actually don't have to deal with the challenge of trying to explore only the area around them and having no information about the rest. Um, initially, it was um, one of the uh, assumptions that we can observe the whole space, which is not fair to humans. To be honest, because you cannot explore the entire space on a, on a small map. Because you don't have pixel perfect vision uh, that, uh, that, that the computer has in that time, because it gets all the information to, from API perfectly. Uh, some of those constraints over time now, the last eight months, have been removed in order to make it more and more uh, like a human game, but they're still not processing pixel data. OpenAI actually said that was a deliberate decision because. And as I think I have to quote one slide, they say it would have taken them an additional 100,000 GPUs to actually process and get the same data, you know, oh. for converting the pixel yeah. like information into the um, floating point numbers that they know. Yeah. So they're accessing the actual API. Yeah, so I, I watched some of the StarCraft videos, and, and they also said the same yeah, thing. Same thing for StarCraft. Yeah. That, that they, they could have trained the agent on the actual camera raster image that they, they chose before for the reasons. Yeah. But they also, I think the, uh, David Silver and the team there, they, they did try to not overly take advantage of some of those. Yes. So one of the key differences, StarCraft two places limitations on the AI that it cannot act faster than a human. In Dota 2, those things are not done beyond only closing every four frames. So actually, the reaction time of the Dota bot, uh, of the Dota AI, is faster than that of the human because of uh, no artificial constraints placed in that. And they don't have to, to do the additional time that actually takes them to process the image and get the values, they get the perfect information, and then process right away. Which gives them, in particular, in one versus one games initially, that's why they were so, able, uh, so fast able to defeat one of the um, top professionals in the internet game. Okay, um, besides the uh, high dimensional things, action space, there's also high dimensional observation space because of the number of heroes, buildings, and other units that are actually uh, part, uh, part of the game. So there are some units that are controlled by uh, the AI or the human, which are the heroes, and there are a lot of additional units that um, supplement uh, the heroes, but they are completely controlled by the game. So that will be seen. And there's a lot of complex rules and much causes particular problems or challenges for the reinforcement learning approaches is that the environment in which the game is actually being played is constantly updated. Dota releases an update every two weeks, and some of the updates when introducing new heroes or even changing uh, some of the ways uh, the hero, a particular hero plays in the game. For instance, it caused one of the heroes to be actually removed from the game because uh, his characteristics have changed so much that the training data was no longer uh, actually representing the hero. So they actually took one out and they're now only playing with 17 uh, heroes that before had actually trained 18. And um, one other thing that we're touching at the end, I think I've uh, had a slide on that one, is how even through changing environments, they were actually able to use a kind of transfer learning approach to continuously use um, the information learned even um, after the game has significantly been changed, which is often an open problem or an important one. And um, they, don't, they don't need a lot of information about this, but just um, five days ago, they released um, a new version of the game and they talked a bit about that. And I think I have some of that part of the history. So the history overall, um, yeah, I think the chart on the right top, right hand side is not very uh, visual. I talked I talk about that. So there are two different things here. On the left-hand side, uh, the timeline really, uh, explains a bit um, how long it has taken them to get from uh, the, really the beginning in November 2016 to be good enough to play professional players at, in a one-on-one -on -one game, which happened at the internationals, which is the annual convention where the best uh, Dota players get together and they have price pools of up to $40 million to actually get for being good at the game. 40, so I think 40 million. 40 million, yes. So it's the most lucrative esports game in the market at the moment. I think we're doing the wrong flash. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. The 
price pool, and your price pool available for Dota is 40 million. You as they can fund their research after all. <laughs> yeah. I keep on hearing complaints about the open AI research. Yeah. I mean, if, uh, later on, I have some stats of how much computer actually run is 40 million. Is uh -huh. Looking at how much computer actually run and in public cloud computing environments after all. So they must get huge discounts from the Microsofts and Google that are actually <laughs> running. Yeah, so in August 2017, they did the first public demonstration and they defeated one of the top uh, professional players uh, by the name of Dendy. And he's the one who actually shared that during the game, when he was uh, decisively beaten, he actually uh, had uh, observed the AI to have certain skills that took him eight years to learn. Yeah, I showed um, that event that they launched the Open AI 5 initiative in August 2017, where they basically said, look, the next step is you want to play 5 to 5. If you're interested in this, join us. So they have actually a lot of um, um, opportunities for collaboration and for contribution online. And one of the initiatives is actually going to start uh, later today. I'm to in a second. So once um, the OpenAI 5 initiative started, it took about a year under the next public demonstration, which uh, again was at uh, the International in August 2018, the year after. So in between, they've done a lot of private and internal competitions that they started to slowly beat human players. And the first time they defeated um, a human was, I think, in May 2018. Uh, initially, they were competing against an internal baseline they scripted. But in April 2018, when they started to beat that internal baseline, the same approach um, didn't work for, for human player. And there is a bit of learning among the other slides of uh, what they had to change. They had to basically introduce randomization to certain parts of the way they, they, they do training. And only after they did this, they even made progress to start to beat um, amateur, uh, amateur uh, uh, humans that never trained as a team, that just played uh, individually. And then slowly they moved up the door to beat uh, semi professional teams. And um, the first game, but he against the professionals, uh, the first two teams they actually lost in August 2018. And um, uh, some of the analysis really puts it at um, they were not good enough at having a long term strategy. They were really good at having short term strategies and getting short term rewards. But oh, sometimes the AI got, got distracted by uh, giving preference to short term rewards over long term rewards. So, really, having a strategy and playing the strategy is uh, what they actually um, weren't that good at um, about eight, uh, eight months ago. And then um, they changed fundamentally uh, uh, how they actually uh, do some of the training. And this is a bit depicted in the right hand side at the top of the chart. Um, but I think we go through this in a later slide. We can't really do that much. It took until April 13, 2019, just five days ago, that there was a second bucket demonstration where they then won back to back games against uh, the world champions who won in the national competition. And then have since defeated every professional team, uh, usually uh, two separate. So they usually play best of the three, and they usually uh, win the first two games. In the game. And often in well under the typical 45 minutes playing time. So the AI since uh, um, the April release is uh, now good enough to to play professional teams. So the one thing that is very interesting, what they've now um, started to explore, is now that we are good enough to beat professional players, how can we use this uh, ability? To make humans better at the play. So they started to introduce cooperative play, which was announced last week. And later tonight, it's, I think 6 p.m. Eastern time, US, US Eastern time, they're starting uh, an arena play where everyone on the internet can play with the bots against other bots. Uh, it's open for three days. The link is at the bottom of the slide. And um, it's for them to generate more publicity as well as more training data how to actually play with the bots. And the bots are actually very good at uh, adopting to the human uh, play, uh, playing style. And some of the public demos they've shown in the professionals that have played with the bots, they actually said this, that uh, the AI has, been, has even had the ability at certain times to sacrifice themselves for better progress of the human play. And there's a lot of additional strategies that can or are being done in that space. The, on the right hand side, the top one, without going to be there, what it actually shows is what was the, the progress that has been made since the August 2018 defeat in order to get to where we are now. And um, I have better sites in that one in a, back in a few minutes. And, off, and one, of, one of the key changes was that 
the underlying LSTM that actually models a lot of the strategies and really kind of hard coded behavior that uh, the, AI, the AI is guided to learn has been um, quadrupled in size from the from 1,024 units LSTM that has now been increased to 4,096 LSTM. Uh, units, units for single layer LSTM. I got the actual architecture slide a bit later on. on the domain. So, what's the generic approach to how um, do they make this work? Um, they are using, as I already mentioned, uh, deep learning combined with reinforcement learning. And in particular, um, uh, proximal policy optimization, which I think we covered before in the lecture. And what they are focused focus on is to simplify the approach in order to have a massively scaled version of it. And I have two slides later on uh, on uh, which parts of uh, PPO, because there are a couple of PPO approaches, which parts they were actually uh, most interested in and have, uh, have spent a lot of time uh, advancing. It's claimed by OpenAI that they entirely learn from self play, which is somewhat true, but the way I would have to put it is they're doing guided self play because what um, the LSTM is really for is modeling how a human would do the game and how to guide uh, what, what are actually important things. If you look back at Go and uh, when the uh, AI was able to beat the Go World Champion, the way the AI was trained was completely only by giving awards for winning or losing the game. So everything else was completely learned. There was no guidance of how one should play the game, what is important in the game. Uh, this uh, is different in Lotta and as well as in StarCraft, they, they uh, spend a lot of time hard coding or creating uh, neural networks that help them uh, guide the bots in their learning journey. That's why I would rather say it's a guided self play instead of just entirely learning from self play. Like getting hints what they should be looking at because um, the exploration space is just uh, too, uh, too, too enormous. So that's that. It's one of the reasons why, why some people online say is um, why this is a significant advancement in AI. The advancement is mainly in the engineering side of reinforcement learning, so how to do how to scale things up, not so much really inventing new approaches, new new, uh, new concepts. And that's one of the things that uh, open AI is also very uh, very uh, forthcoming about that. It was deliberate that they that they looked at this uh, side of it. They actually didn't. Think that they would uh, be able to catch up so fast. With. Some actual stats on the compute side of things. So, in the, in the table on the right hand side, we have um, OpenAI one versus one, the bot which uh, defeated one of the best players back in August 2017. They trained on 60,000 CPUs and had about 256 GPUs um, and had a big thank you message to Microsoft to sure to sponsor a large part of them. And they had about 300 years of training for the particular hero uh, that they gained the day. They translated that into the amount of carbon that was lost. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes, but <laughs> this is <clears throat> nothing compared to what they're doing now. So back they in the office, they also make their powers for the power by solar. Mm. Oh. <laughs> mm. Yeah. So, so back in August 2018, when they lost the first two public games, five versus five. Their training was based on 128,000 CPUs, CPU cores, two, uh, still 256 GPUs for the higher grade, significantly more powerful. And um, they accumulated about 180 years of training experience per hero per day. And at that time, they trained only five heroes. They limited the game to five heroes and had a lot of other restrictions placed in the game. But what they've changed since is they increased the compute by a factor of eight, which means they are running a million CPU cores. <laughs> yes. So they don't actually publish the actual number, but in a blog post released five days ago, they actually uh, put the number eight times more training compute. And they are now uh, accumulating 250 years per day of experience per hero, and they, are, they started to train 18 heroes, but took one out, so they are working with 17 heroes now. So they have, I think I read somewhere about close to 50,000 years of training experience. And uh, the training is running since eight months. 
and they have been able to use the transferring approach to even have, when they make changes to the game or the way to the training, but they do, do not lose the, uh, the things they've learned um, through their time. I think that's another part that uh, goes a bit into that. Is it like they somehow fast forward the game? Like, how can I get so they continue to play 24 7. I suppose that the game is played at real time. Yeah, but they're not playing one game at a time, so it's 45 minutes. They don't, they don't fast forward, they still play. Okay, so this is like 45 minutes into a number of machines that translate to that number. They don't say actually how many games they run at a time, they only say how much compute they actually get. Are they actually yeah. computing each frame, or did they just get every four frames? Every four frames. So they don't even they don't even actually have to compute the first three frames through the through their no, system. So, right? so they're getting uh, the results from the API for every four frames. Okay. So they could theoretically just just pass that information, right? They don't actually have to go uh, at, at real time. They could go at four x. Yes, but I think there's one slide that they basically say is that some of the communication time and the GPU processing uh, is just. Uh, nicely matched with each oh. other because I think they don't have the ability from that command and that's a slight more architecture they don't okay. that they actually can really speed it up. At least I haven't read anything about this and mm. I don't think it's possible. Okay. And here one of the weaknesses they actually acknowledge so that's from open AI is that um, when they got the field in August 2018 they had no long term strategy and they were very bad at really doing the last the last hit. So they got um, to kill off their enemies almost but getting the last hit doing the last flow was a bit of a challenge. And it uh, has something to do with what the expect of the reward is uh, that, uh, that uh, the hero will, will strike the flow is actually expected. And they um, put a lot of effort in getting that on. So the April has no official stats to these, so I just got some of those comments from videos or some additional blogs. So a lot of people have said OpenAI as well as uh, DeepMind, they are cheating a bit. In uh, very similar ways. And one of the reasons is was they're using the API. So, what you can see on the right hand side on top is how the human use the game. So, we look at the pixels, but the AI uh, gets fed uh, a number of um, floating points from the actual API. And they get a pixel token. So, it's, um, it's, it's, it's uh, kind of a, a different challenge. And the reaction time, as I mentioned before, is um, about 80 milliseconds for the AI, which is faster than how the human actually works. And OpenAI publicly we actually mentioned that um, it was a deliberate decision not to lock off uh, the pixels in order to make faster progress and focus on certain up, uh, certain other techniques, really to model uh, the complexity of the space in the game, and um, that they would have that they save popular trees by not using a few hundred thousand GPUs just to get from the top to the bottom. Yeah. 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 But they actually don't do any um, penalty on the AI to slow down. Which, which is different to what StarCraft 2 does. So the DeepMind approach, they uh, make sure that uh, the AI cannot act faster than the humans. They, they put artificial constraints on it because of, um, of that simplification. Of it. There's a lot of tasks that have been simplified during training, and agents receive guidance in what they should be learning, which um, is not a complete set, uh, set from the dimension. And the model has been hand aside, and I have an older version of the model as a network architecture lifetime in a few slides. Yeah. Then there are also good limitations on the game. So initially, when uh, they started to win five or five games, they won so to cause the entire map was visible to them. And uh, the humans are usually not uh, playing the game that way. So they don't, uh, they're good at um, observing things that are outside of the normal uh, event horizon. And then when they won two games against uh, kind of semi-professional teams and they took the visibility away so to play the game with the normal rules in terms of visibility that you can only observe your uh, new environment, the AI actually lost quite precisely. And then um, the reward shaping, as I mentioned before, it's not purely self-placed, they um, it's, it's tuned and uh, a lot of uh, guided uh, observation and behavior put into the, into the actual models. Um, why this is often raised as a criticism for open AI, um, their agenda is to work towards general artificial intelligence. So things that should be that should be learned that can be applied to other domains. 
which is um, not possible if you have a lot of handcrafted guidance in how to take it. So it's not, not easy to, to actually generalize some of the things that, uh, that are in this. So this is a diagram that I found um, that OpenAI I released. It's dated June 6, 2018. So this is the old version of the LSTM, which has 1,024 units. And it's computed for each hero. So on top, you see five different layers. So they have one of those uh, LSTMs uh, for you. So um, this one is all run uh, five times. And um, you, if, you have, if you take a look at the slides and you can read some of the boxes, it actually tells you uh, what they're actually looking at, some of the attributes, and what kind of capabilities they're actually modeling uh, in, in, uh, inside, uh, inside uh, the, the, the LSTM. And by now, by April 2019, this has grown by a factor of four. So they're now modeling 4,096 units. So a lot of it has to do with additional capabilities that weren't modeled previously, but then also refining some of the guidance that's been provided uh, to the AI, what, uh, what other things they should be looking for or learning, or where they, they, they knew and got feedback, what things they didn't do very well when they actually lost the game back in August. So this one here, I put it in the model structure. It's, it's now been changed to 4,096 uh, units. Um, they see all the game stats. They use the uh, the, uh, the bot API, which gives them all the all the values for every four frame. And um, in each move, so they look at the 20,000 numbers as uh, as they see the world, and they generate eight values, which uh, basically is then translated into an action. Uh, it's, it's shown in the photo. So. What we can actually do is, what they released for the old model, they actually released a sample how we can see, how you would see how, what they receive as inputs and how they actually uh, make decisions. That's one of the blog posts. Um, they provide a little information online on OpenAI blog. And Okay. Yeah. Now we have to run it from the other Okay. Yeah. I didn't. Have, I don't have the problem. Well, this is far much that in fact it also run from my laptop. Yeah, it's like it's like So this this Mac cannot read. So sorry about it, my laptop was So, okay, I, I, I let you guys uh, check that link out yourself. So what you can basically do is, if you go to that uh, link on the blog, it actually um, visualizes the 20,000 numbers that the, that the bot gets in a view that you can see, and then shows you the eight numeration uh, values that, uh, that an action actually triggers. So you get an idea of uh, what information uh, the bot actually takes, and they, they, they move a bit through the game to show what, what they pay attention to in a particular, uh, in order to make a particular decision. The other thing that's important to note is that um, one of the things they actually observed is since the training has been uh, restricted uh, to, um, to certain parts um, of the game, they didn't model, for instance, certain concepts, like there are areas on the map where um, it rains down certain uh, shrapnels, which actually um, 
heroes try to avoid when they when 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 they end when, when they when they see the area, which which is something they didn't train. So what happened to the to the bots? They still walk in those areas because the concept wasn't modeled. But um, now they suddenly suddenly uh, um, notice that that their health was decreasing because they're going going hit by something which uh, which they didn't see coming. It wasn't, wasn't modeled. They still managed to get out of those areas without dying. So they learned concepts that they weren't actually talked about. Some of the things there is possibility or uh, some self learning involved that is not actually guided. But they cannot avoid getting into those areas. Okay, another concept that I think we covered a couple of weeks back in the reinforcement learning approaches that's very important is how to actually explore the space. So, really, exploration. Um, and how the guidance from the LSTMs can, uh, can benefit the exploration and how weights and rewards have to be shaped accordingly in order to drive the bots to explore, explore certain things um, a bit deeper because it's important for the gameplay but they have to manage to pick up by themselves. And that was in particular uh, changed a lot after they were completed back in August 2018. So as I mentioned before, it's guided self-play. And uh, initially, uh, when they started training the current model, which uh, was started in June 2018, they started with random weights. And then they let uh, the bots explore the environment. And uh, one thing they actually um, shared on, and they said, in the first games, when they actually observed what is going on, the heroes just walked endlessly around the map. And after several hours of training, they already um, managed to understand basic concepts like the three lanes that exist on the map, how to level up, how to fight over certain um, uh, enemies that actually emerged, the automated enemies as well as uh, the other heroes. And then it took them several days to, to learn some basic human strategies of how to, uh, what things are actually important and so on. And it took them about uh, two months of real time um, to be able to play um, against uh, against human teams. And now, eight months down the road of real time, they are able to defeat professional teams. At, at some point in the game, certain changes had to be made in the way they guide uh, the learning process, and uh, in particular, in exploring alternative strategies. So one of the things that they learned in August 2018 was they don't have uh, good long-term strategies and then they are doing certain things that are not productive in terms of getting to, to, to the, the grand objective of winning the game. And, uh, there was a lot of exploration and strategies in place that uh, was, was just short on focus. So they, uh, as far as one of the reasons why they changed uh, the LSDM to, uh, to, give them better, to give them better guidance and exploring under uh, other approaches. And what helped a lot, and this was something they learned back in the early days when they had the one versus one play, is that they should randomize um, certain properties that are um, important uh, for, um, for modeling units. So then they, had, they got a greater variety which helped them to explore different uh, strategy spaces. As well as uh, how rewards are being formed in order for certain metrics. And the rewards that uh, were, were important um, or that the AIs were told that are important are the same rewards that the human actually looks at. It's the net worth, the kills, the deaths, the assists, the last hits, and, uh, and, and, and things, things as such. But um, it takes a lot of care to craft those rewards. Uh, uh. And then they actually normalize the rewards later on so that an individual bot in particular is important for the team play is not getting selfish. So that the overall team rewards are um, kind of uh, you, uh, you use as a baseline. Okay, so getting a bit more uh, to the underlying technology for the reinforcement learning side is, um, I'm not sure whether we mentioned OpenAI Rapid four, but it's one of the training environments that was created for OpenAI. And uh, the PPO approach is actually executed in this. It's uh, run in the gym environment. And um, the OpenAI training system consists of a number of rollout workers, which according to the diagram below, they have about 500 uh, CPUs, which refers back to um, the approach from uh, June 2018, where they still had um, 128,000 uh, CPU cores. 
So I think if we add up the numbers, we can actually figure out how many games they play uh, at a time. So um, they, they use a, a stack of optimizers, uh, rollout workers, as well as evaluation workers. The evaluation workers, they are, they are playing in various environments that refer back to previous versions of the game. So to make sure that a new version of the game is not uh, diverting from uh, some of the things that uh, kind of is not unlearning some of the things that were actually uh, being done before. So they always play about 80% of uh, the games with the latest version and 20% of the games with previous versions. And um, on the right hand side, um, you actually see that uh, there's some CPU processing going on with the optimizer and uh, uh, creating uh, the send updates are being uh, executed. And the model parameters, which um, accumulate to about 50K uh, data, are being uh, pushed and synchronized to the model parameter database. And one thing that was actually mentioned is that this data communication and the GPU processing is roughly uh, happening at the same speed so that there's no, uh, that are no trade off. And that is probably one of the reasons why I think that they can't really speed up the game, at least not uh, the way that's been done at the moment. Because otherwise, they can't sync the model parameters fast enough if they were tr uh, trying to do it. So, okay, so they have a parameter server, that's the purple one. And uh, they're, they're doing two sets of uh, work here. They have the evaluation workers, which, which are doing Yes, so they're playing in, um, in different environments. So they're not playing the latest version of the game, they're playing in previous versions of the game. Uh -huh. So. Um, these are to build extra trajectories and training data. Uh, what's the difference between the ones in the rollout workers? Is that to get the current policy? Optimizer plus connected rollout workers. Yes, and that happens, they're running 256 times uh, uh, of them. Right. So 256 of them, no times, 256 of them. So they're running 80% against the current bots, 20% against um, the 80% against the current, 20% against the old one, and then they have randomized game parameters, and then they push data every 60 seconds to, uh, to, to, um, to the to actual database where they get the game parameters from and store them. They play alternative environments versus the hard, so this is bot versus bot. This is um, the bots playing versus the hardcoded baseline and some other games that they pre-recorded. Hardcoded baseline is what um, the initial game was about, and only once they managed to defeat this, they started to play against students. So, they, can I say that they bootstrap using the power workers on the bottom? So, that, that's like. It's not. not like so, that. they actually say is they're not using bootstrapping in any form, mm -hmm. but um, it's just making sure that um, they're not unlearning something that they learned before. So, that they know is the way, the, the direction uh, mm -hmm. the, the learning is going is on the right track. Okay, so this is more like some type of validation or something to just yeah. make sure that the, their policy is not diverging too yeah. far. So yeah. they continue to train over the, the previous uh, uh, baseline uh, environments that they want the system to still perform a lot. Is that, yeah. that right? Yeah, so at, at least the, the way I understand what this is. Okay. But it's interesting that they they put a lot of timing on the, the about workers, right? This is about since you know, 2,500 CPUs versus 500 for the Yes, but the 500 running on 256 instances. Oh. oh, okay. Yeah. So this one is highly parallelized. Uh -huh. This one um, is not, they don't actually say how many times they run that. Okay. It's just on a set number of, and here there is three, <coughs> hard, uh, the hard coded baseline, uh -huh. then some previous uh, sim uh, simulator port, which they assess. What's called the true skill, which is the Microsoft definition of how well you play the game. Yeah, which is also the previous well. chart. Yeah. Uh -huh. And then um, they're playing against themselves. So uh, basically, open AI human teams. Right, right. Yeah. And you can try to point using the, the mouse pad if you want. Yeah, I'm sure. Okay, yeah. So um, hard coded, uh, previous um, similar bots as well as serve. So that's, that's literally playing on the screen where the open AI developers can observe the game. So just not curious, you mentioned like the last hit wasn't doing that well, right? yeah. And then so so then if that wasn't doing that well, and then the the AI doesn't really learn it, they go and put in the reward function. So it's a... no, uh, so they did a, a couple of changes. So they changed um, 
the guy in LS, uh, LSDM. Yeah. So they, they try to give different rewards or um, teach teach the AI to look for different strategies, what I mentioned before. So they change the way they, they do the guided exploration. So they should not just look for short-term rewards. So they told basically certain strategies are not important to get to the end goal. One of the things that they actually mentioned is that um, there's special, um, um, I think, automated enemy. The I don't know the game much. It's called the, Ro the Roshan. Oh. And um, what actually happened is what they observed while they were playing a different team, often they diverted to try to uh, go to the Rohan. But I think they say, I read somewhere, that it takes about one minute of uh, of a team's time to defeat the Rohan for an additional reward. So, and they're often checking um, that path. So they often waste a lot of time that doesn't want to do the overall objective. But that was one of the things that they basically told the AI by changing the strategies, trying not to do this as often as they do it. So there are certain benefits for doing that in the game overall. For instance, um, for, 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 le for leveling up, but it's not uh, contributing towards the overall strategy or something like that. So one of the things that actually uh, made them uh, made the AI learn is that this is less important and you should focus on other things. Yeah. So they coded that explicitly through through their report. I think that's that's part of the of, of the LSDM design. Yeah. Um, I, I had a slide here. It was when you yeah. uh, stepped out. Right. So this is the old version from June 2018, and now um, this has quadrupled in size, where they are modeling additional parameters of the system that they don't model before, as well as giving additional guidance. So, so, so it's like, if they don't want um, the AI to go, and, like, go over the Roshan, then they will kind of like add an additional node in the LSD and kind of control that parameter. So, uh, um, so it, it's, a, it's a combination. They basically try to teach it to to emphasize, to emphasize in different ways of exploring okay. strategies, as well as uh, tweaking the rewards. So one of the things that they actually mentioned is they had to in introduce even more randomization. So that when they started to beat um, the scripted baseline, they, they did very badly against humans. So they started to introduce randomization during training of, um, of a lot of the uh, properties of the units that uh, they are they're doing. And then after August 2018, when they got defeated, they in they increase the amount of randomization they're actually doing in order to to give more uh, uh, time or more opportunity to explore other strategies. So they were exposed to a large variety of uh, of things that, that happened in the actual game. The randomization uh, was mentioned a few times, but this is uh, very important. So going back to Yihui's question, then um, is it that LSTM has a, a particular action head for that type of thing? Is that was introduced explicitly, or yeah? Um, Maybe I I, I can't not, I can't share. Sure. I think they uh, didn't share a lot of yes. details on how they yeah of course that, yeah that, yeah right yeah but so, I guess there are different a couple different ways it can be implemented yeah. right you could say I'm going to explicitly introduce it as an action head right. to say whether I want to yeah, figure so, it going yeah, to that yeah. direction or I can put it in the reward function yeah so I was thinking maybe that's that's something that they, because I, I think they mentioned something like 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 they share action head for like dropping walls that like, they can see versus walking in it. Then they noticed that it wasn't doing the action so well, so he just okay. decided to split it and then initialize it in the same way as before, and then they train it like that. So I think like like in the sense like like the architecture they they, they, they just keep splitting nodes if, if they realize that certain nodes was kind of like restricting certain strategy. Yeah. So this one was the visibility one was one thing that learned when they I think they played a semi-professional team, they won the first few games, then they actually um, removed the, the full visibility of the map and then they decided they lost. Then they actually started to tune more and spend more emphasis on actually training their bots with limited visibility. Because initially they trained almost full visibility. Yeah. So they, as far as I know, as of the day, they haven't shared the 4096 uh, unit LSTM. The one that was online, that I found online, is um, only the old version from June 2018. Okay. So what they actually run uh, inside their um, reinforcement learning uh, system is um, the proximal policy optimization approach. Then, um, so, and what OpenAI said initially is um, it performs comparative or better than state of the art approaches by being much simpler to implement and tune. So, a lot of emphasis, what I actually said is it, their advancement is in, in the engineering the solutions to work at a much larger scale much more complex problem, but not so much at finding more novel approaches. So simplicity over um, um, getting uh, a complicated new, model, right? Yeah, not, not so much complicated model, but really trying to 
to invent something new. Okay. Yeah. There's lots of approaches to actually use this really um, uh, from uh, from existing uh, reinforcement learning uh, concepts. Okay. So, um, the policy creating method which we covered a few times uh, has obviously the convergence problem. I think we, uh, we mentioned that a few times before, and that's uh, in practice something uh, that uh, limits scalability. So, they they were looking at how can we um, find alternative approaches. And um, that, that, that are much easier to scale. And in a couple of slides, you will see that they propose two different uh, approaches for, uh, for PPO. And uh, the, the second approach is the more simple approach, and that's actually the one that is being adopted uh, in India. Okay, um, so this is um, the references four and five. I'm, most, I'm mostly going for this. I don't want to step through the actual math too much. I have a few screenshots in the next few slides. So it's the question is, how can we optimize the policy to maximize the rewards? So it's um, um, uh, a well-known approach is to use the MM algorithm, uh, minorize, maxim maximize it. So we starting off with random uh, policy, which is the M policy here. And what we're trying to do is the, the black dot, we're trying to maximize the reward and finding an approach um, uh, how to actually use this. So exploring the space, um, typical approaches of that would be uh, to use either uh, linear search or kind of to use, I think we discussed this in one of the earlier lectures when we talked about uh, the tightrope approach, where there are certain areas where we know we want to step in and certain areas where we don't want to step in because we don't want to fall, fall off the rope. There we have basically trust zones. So two of the optimization uh, methods that are possible is uh, linear search, which is really uh, utilizing gradient descent. Following, uh, let's say, if you're at this particular spot, we are try, uh, spot, we're trying to find, uh, we come to, 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 to the next higher ground. So we, we, we take small steps in, uh, in a direction that gives us uh, more, uh, more local rewards. Versus a trust zone approach, where we are, if you're at this spot, we know the area that is close by. So we make, we're taking a small step which stays within the area, but gives us a better result. So we're taking smaller steps. You're, you're being more careful and then taking step by step. So, and uh, one of the things that uh, PPO is uh, going to do is PPO is going to follow the trust zone approach. So the rhetor says, we, we don't want to have big incremental changes. We want to have small changes. And uh, we, we rather forego big changes at the risk of uh, going the wrong way. So they want to limit how far a policy can change with each iteration, and they're using uh, KL diversions for this, which is a measure between two different data distributions, originally P and Q, how much they differ. And uh, they want to contain uh, the difference. So what uh, PPO has actually been doing is they're repurposing this approach in order that they're not looking at the difference between two data distributions, they're looking at the difference between two policies, policy P and policy Q. And um, they are reformulating the problem, or the math is in the paper and um, on the other blog post that I have in the, in the materials. And they're reformulating the problem now in this uh, KL uh, divergence space, where, where we have the KL divergence here on the right-hand side, and we have two other factors, the M and the L. And the M, the initial, the, uh, the lower upper bound, um, you know, the, the blue curve, is um, we're starting off just choosing a random curve and then we're slowly moving our way up until we get, uh, get to this point using kind of a trust zone approach. And finding the M and the L is, uh, is, uh, is, is what's, the, what's the challenge problem that, that you cover on the next side. So the intuition behind this here for PPO is that it um, L approximates uh, the advantage function that is local to the current policy. And Right, as you roll out, it's going to be less accurate. Yeah, so, and we're trying to keep the, the accuracy in check. And the inaccuracy actually defines the upper bound. But we constrain how far how far this inaccuracy can, uh, can go, which, which actually defines the M. So the M is the same, the similar M. in, in the yes. trust region, right? Yeah, so, so, it's, it's, a, yes. so the inaccuracy right. is allowed within the particular trust region. So we can take small steps and we 
where we uh, possibly use or gain something. And we want, of course, step into the direction where we gain with respect to uh, the KL divergence. Right. Yeah. So reformulating uh, the actual objective can be done in two, in two possible ways. I don't, I don't go through the math. But the traditional approach would be to uh, take the actual objective, use an actual policy gradient approach, but from a computational perspective, calculating the natural policy gradient involves calculating complex matrices as well as their in, uh, inverse, which is computationally too expensive. So that is the more common approach that uh, other approaches that use. PPO is not going that way. PPO, so I think we covered in lectures TRPO and ACKTR, which followed the approach with the gradient descent. That was think, in, in, in the only slides. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So PPO follows a different approach, which, um, which is uh, what was uh, um, just roughly depicted before, is really having a soft constraint and trying to take small, small advancements instead of having uh, a hard constraint and, uh, and, and using a uh, certain center approach. And um, they formulated two, uh, two policies, which is PPO with adaptive uh, KL penalty, as well as uh, PPO with uh, so-called clipped objective. So that was the initial approach, and it's covered uh, in, uh, in, in, in the paper. So here, they formulate the objective by changing the constraint, the <coughs> soft constraint, to a penalty the objective function, which gives almost as good of a performance as alternative approaches with TRPO but still not good enough that it can be scaled uh, significantly. So then they proposed uh, the second approach, which is the clipped objective, uh, PPO with clipped objective, which maintains uh, two policy networks, the policy to refine, and the policy from which the, the last samples were collected, and then does important sampling. So it actually evaluates the new policy based on the samples collected with the old policy, and then sees how far this gets us uh, forward without taking too much risk. And this is in part because you can train both of the networks in parallel. Yes. Right? So you, you get the savings there because you don't have to do things in series. Yeah. yeah. And so this is, even in mathematical terms, complete, uh, significantly simplifying uh, the problem and uh, allowing it uh, to be scaled up to, um, to, to a large number of batches running on. So, without going through um, the math and details on the paper, it's, but open AI said is um, Q learning with function approximation facing many simple problems and is purely understood. But little policy creating methods have poor data efficiency and robustness, and trust reach and policy optimization, which is um, the approach following the, uh, the first um, alternative, is relatively complicated. And it's not compatible with architectures that include noise or parameter sharing. So they rather call PPO with clipped objectives, which is much more simpler, but um, allows um, for a much larger um, space to actually be explored, a much more complex problem to be addressed. Let me go back a slide. So um, here on the bottom row, you mm -hmm. mentioned the clipping objective. So maybe you can discuss that a little bit here. So in the formula, um, the clip part of it says that we take the reward of taking the, the current action, I guess, um, but bound it within uh, one plus or minus epsilon, right? So I guess that's implementing an idea that the rewards have to be bounded within a certain region. Is that correct? Getting a minimum of two terms. One of them is the clipped reward times the AT. It's the same term. <clears throat> so it's basically taking, let's say, the current state versus, and this and must be the step in the trust zone. So this, so this model is uh, kind of the trust zone. Yeah. Yeah, so this, this model is the trust zone, and this one uh, basically gives us that. And this, this one bounces that. Mm -hmm. I 
can understand the clipping, but then they're taking the minimum of these two terms. One is without the clipping, one is with the clipping, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. yeah. So can I say it's some type of pessimistic reward because you're taking the minimum between these two terms? Or erring on the side of caution to so get very high QB. So this is the same content as in the extra paper, but I'm um, not a stepping through and explaining it. So it's the one with the objective, so it's the two policies. Oh, RT is not reward, sorry. It's the ratio of how different the policies are. Okay. You construct a new objective function to flip the estimated advantage function if the new policy is too far away. Yeah, so that, 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 that's still um, the, the trust zone approach. Right, right, yeah. right. So just making sure the new policy does not divert too much from the old policy. Otherwise, if the new policy actually diverts too much, they discard the new policy. Mm -hmm. They go back to the, yeah. to the original. Yeah, so they want to minimize the risk they're willing to take. Yes, yeah, so I think Jirash's interpretation is correct, right? Yeah. So yes, yeah. actually. If the probability ratio between the new policy and the old policy falls outside of the range, the advantage function will be clipped. So okay. the new policy is only uh, retained if it stays within the bound. Right. It's a version of uh, trust region policy of that seeking by computing it over the advantage function. Yeah. Yeah. So I think uh, okay. Yeah. okay, so the, the one other point um, I wanted to make, and that goes to back to the diagram we saw earlier on when I talked about, about the history, which is not very visible on the slide here, is that actually one of the other achievements that I actually uh, managed to make is. Um, to add transfer learning into their um, reinforcement learning approach. So the current version that was literally uh, used last week to defeat uh, the professional team as well as will be used from the night onwards to have the open game uh, for three days uh, has been trained since June 2018. So that's, um, um, that's depicted here on the slide. Um, in this diagram, it starts on the right hand side of June 2018 and shows in a number of days how the algorithm has been improved and it has certain markers which improvements have actually been made. So, um, June 2018 is here on the left hand side. Um, roughly 80 days in, they had this competition at the international in August 2018 where they lost against the professional teams. And then, changes they made shortly after was to increase the LSTM size to 4096. And then there's a lot of other changes being made which are not being uh, uh, communicated. One other concept they actually put in is called buyback, which is a feature that wasn't modeled before. And then there were two main changes um, introduced into the .dot.r game itself. So they did two major revisions, 720 and 721, which uh, changed, uh, for instance, how some of the heroes' um, uh, stats are uh, affecting the game. And they, they lost one hero <coughs> doing one of those two upgrades because it, it was too difficult um, to move forward. But what, what they actually said is, even though that they had all those changes that they applied either internally or the way they actually guide their agents, or the, the changes that are actually in the game, they did not lose the information that was learned back from June 2018, and they've been able to always um, get those uh, changes that are applied, uh, transferred uh, to, uh, when, when models are actually being, uh, being upgraded. And then training continues. So I think it's a time span of about 10 months, June to April, and they have 
they have eight months of continuous uh, learning or training actually in this uh, eight, eight months in real time, which accumulates to, if I remember right, about 40,000, 45,000 years of actually playing time. Anything special or just continue playing um, and, and they have apart from a short paragraph of that they have disabilities they have not the least <laughs> yeah. so we just continue yeah. playing so the and first time they actually talked about this was in the blog post on last Sunday after the April 13 announcement that supplement amended uh, that but there's no technical documentation of how, how they actually don't do that or how, how they do that. You can you say how they identify like so so like they actually expanded the LSTM, right? So right. I think they probably, yeah, the one where they went to four thousand. Right, right. right. But then they didn't really say like like how they actually go about doing like like doing but they say like so for example like if you have I, I guess for no, right? Let's say initially the for for the for the one thousand part of LSTM, this not represents like two mm -hmm. action. Right. And then they realize that these two actions are not really doing that well in terms of uh, then they will kind of split the node and initialize them in the same way and then they train it. Um, so that's the idea of transferring. They, they do that. That's yeah, that's why they, they, there's like one paragraph. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so that's like yeah, something that they kind of hide in the details. Like, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, we can go to the blog post. It says the current version of yeah. OpenAI Pi has been training continuously despite changes to the model size and the game rules. In each case, we will able to make transfer of the model over and continue training, like uh, we said, said um, something that is an open challenge for RL and other domains. To the best of our knowledge, this is the first time an RL agent has been trained using such a model of training them. To make this work, we continue to flesh out our surgery cooling. Uh, <laughs> architectural changes. So, uh, so there's no technical uh, reference. It's only paragraph that actually talks about it. They do have a hyperlink to what they mean by surgery. Mm -hmm. So they said, we invested heavily in quote, yeah. surgery unquote tooling, which mm -hmm. allows us to map old parameters to a new network architecture, right? Uh, which is what you were saying right, earlier about the awards. Our tooling lets us split the head into two clones initialized with the same parameters. So I guess what they're doing is, uh, like you said, when they they're Changing the LSTM size, they just multiply the heads or something and then mm -hmm. initialize them with all the same values. So they're just getting more resolution, right? Uh, and then training from there. So when they, they, they see the parameter is important, then they could clone the head or whatever state and then introduce uh, a start, start training from there. So they kind of really transfer to like drastically different architecture, but it's more like mutating the existing architecture to, to kind of uh, fit like better things. Yeah, I guess and it's... then you keep training it. Yeah, right. But, but, so but you can't like it separate. Right? Yeah, but you can't get like really different architecture. Like, it, like the, the basically is just between the nodes, right? I think the challenging part is more when they introduce like the buyback, a new concept into the architecture. And oh, then they, right. but they said initially they usually in, uh, initializing it to random values. So that part then they just keep random values. So the buyback is like when the hero die and then they kind of buy back the gold. Is that is that what buyback? Right? No. I think that's yeah. what my bad is. <laughs> Based on my experience, I think that's what my bad is. <laughs> but they do have an updated uh, open AI model with 2048 units there. Okay. Yeah, it's on the same size stock. Yeah, but I was just really wondering like, how they kind of select like, which node to speak, right? Because they thought they had some sort of Heuristic to kind of see like that. Since he now found one which has surgery. Yeah, yeah that's like yeah. surgery too. Was the first one had about 1024, and yeah. I found one with 2048, so oh, actually yeah. not a single step upgrade. Oh, so okay. they seem to have done multiple revisions, uh -huh. and then basically try to see what works and what doesn't work. Uh, yeah. Well, I'll just pull it up from yeah. yeah. That's really good. Oh, of course, it's a, it's a, it's a cloud uh, font asset. You cannot use it. Oh, I can't yeah, use it's, it. it's, 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 I think it's, it's session specific. Oh, okay. Let me get the other URL then. Sorry. Sorry. 
So in that case, it's just increasing the number of parameters in the network, right? Yeah, yeah, splitting the nodes. But it's just like how they identify which node is like, like how do they actually gauge like what these nodes do? They gotta have an understanding of what it is actually contributing to to kind of split it, right? And it's super strange, right? <laughs> I was under the impression that the model weights are not reusable. Okay. Like if you change the architecture definition, even yeah, like yeah. introducing a clone of a particular layer, say. So maybe what would happen is like for some time the performance would go down, then like the improvement would kick in probably. And you were so here, the they are only reporting yeah. what happened after a certain amount of training. Yeah. So not right. Yeah. Okay, not you split time. right away and then what's yeah, the accuracy like yeah. or score like? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But funnily enough, it's the same timestamp that the other model has. 6 June 2018. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's not. Is this, not, is this the update? This is what was on the blog post, but I don't know. It actually looks more or less similar. The only thing that I see has changed is this bot has changed. Okay. This was, I think this was just one continuous line. Now this slice. It says slice 0 to 512. Oh, it's before the LSTM. Max pool across players, and then here yeah. LSTM has 2048 yeah. units. Yeah. But they don't tell you what units are exactly for this to have the same yeah. units as the output. Max pool across players, so like pool across the five different regions, or? So, so the five different layers, right? So it's like this, like a general one layer. So the five different layers are not connected at all. So those are the units. So the players, no, by right, there should be replicas, which are so they should replicas? be actually the same. But then the max the same pool across players, yeah. are they are they max pooling across all these chunk layers or just just this one layer? So they say max pooling across players down here, right? Yeah, yeah. 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 They're talking about in this lower left yeah. hand corner. Is it over all of these blue units? These are players, and then oh, these are players. No, those are the different units you encounter in the game. The players are are are, are here. Oh, okay. Yeah, so this one says player one, two, three, four, five. Okay, the white white layers yeah. are are the players. So yeah. then this max pool across players must run across all the, the white tiles, right? Ah, does that make sense? So they're not independent after all. They have a part of the architecture that links all these five together. Yeah, so that looks like it's cheating. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so it's actually one big model. <laughs> well, it's big. Yeah. If that's the case, it's one big model. <laughs> it's just. <laughs> What are the units uh, like? Like, what is the blue blue the blue box are, are like? So uh, they have unit IP or what? They actually, don't say the. Is that, are those the heroes? I think they're all the NPCs. Anything yeah, the NPCs. that's moving. Yeah. Okay. Anything, anything that's uh, uh, part of the model, right? It could be an NPC that moves or a stationary unit with health or something like that. So you have all these uh, one through n units, and you're you're getting them characterized into this. Uh, Bottom uh, right. Ending, right? Yeah. Is, it, is that buyback on the first yeah, yeah. one? Buyback? Buyback, number of deaths, right, ability right. Oh, to yeah, those are, those are the heroes. Activate, use, teleport, team, the team level. Yeah, so, the, so, so this, this thing up here says heroes only. Yeah. So this, oh, this is just for, for the units that are okay. heroes. Yeah. But right, this right. one over here, this one over here is for oh, any type of oh, the NPCs in the jungle. Yeah. So it's a very specific architecture, right? Yeah. I wonder how, how much it cost them to run this over like 10 months. <laughs> Was it more than the 40 million pool money? <laughs> I don't think so, right? Open AI is under a lot of fire for not yeah, delivering okay. anything on its goods except for lots of sensational publicity. Yes. Right? That's what I've heard is, is that they're not making good on their their promises as, except for generating Dota and uh, uh, Starcraft. I don't know how true that is. You have to go back to your stats. Um, I'm not making closing. Sorry. Yeah.
ช้าคันใช่ไหมใช่ครับเดี๋ยวสิบเดือนตัวเองนะสิ This is the previous version, but they actually didn't have that part. Oh, yeah. Inside was this yeah. part is missing. Mm -hmm. yeah. Maybe the previous one wasn't communicating. Yeah. The, 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 the latest one is actually a, a full model mm -hmm. with like all the all the players. Yeah. Yeah. But this one is exactly the same day. It was also dated 6 June. And everything else looks more as the day. My guess is whoever updated the diagram forgot to update the timestamp. <laughs> <laughs> So I read, I, I read a blog post recently. They were saying that it's actually one model with like five. Like there's this blog post by this MIT uh, PhD student, and then he, he kind of reviewed, and he was like saying it's essentially one big neural net with four five different users. So I guess that's where the max pooling actually. Happened. So that from the architecture diagram that we were just looking at doesn't seem like that. It seems yeah. like it's, it's sharing some information about. Yeah. The other players at the current timestamp, okay. but it's still separate agents, okay. right? It's just like I have some information about, um, like each of the different players, right? Like under other heels, yeah, from the the max pooling, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. There are a couple of Reddit threads that are trying to discuss how much they coordinate between each other, and there's a lot of split opinion of whether they are yeah. communicating or not. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, they are quarreling about that on, on Reddit and all that sort of thing. Quite so interesting. So I don't think they're communicating. It doesn't look like from their architecture that they're communicating explicitly. They're sharing state yeah. information, but they're they're training and, and making their decisions independently. If, right? if they're sharing the full state information, they're actually knowing what decision the other ones should make in the best interest. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, it, but what what they yeah. actually said is. That in order to do that, they would have to recompute each each uh, hero has to recompute also compute state of other. Mm -hmm. one. So to make okay. this definitely not doing and that. And they don't have to get windy so that. And there was one guy from OpenAI who actually commanded if he would if he would have this uh, source capability, we would rather do other things. Yeah. <laughs> <I think> so. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> someone would lie on the on the Reddit thread from OpenAI. Actually, actually that's that's already. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's like one of their ask me anything sessions. Okay. So the last slide is really just um, some of the open challenges that I mentioned, um, and or people think that uh, they should explore. So let's maybe um, open AI has really been trying to push the engineering or uh, scalability. Uh, Capabilities for uh, state-of-the-art approaches. While we really are two challenges would be more on um, trying to explore different uh, different ways how we can actually model uh, different forms of strategies and have a mix of short and long-term uh, planning uh, as part of the model. To more independent self-learning, because the self-learning here is uh, very much guided, and it's the same for the StarCraft two uh, game. StarCraft two has a mix of supervised and um, uh, learning uh, capabilities uh, as well that are actually uh, guiding the self -learning. And then um, abstract reasoning within the model as well as into the specification of objectives would be um, uh, beneficial because the objectives that are uh, used at the moment are mainly for the LSTM. So there's a lot of guidance in terms of what constitutes a good reward, what constitutes a bad reward, and uh, what kind of uh, exploration should is beneficial to the overall objective of the game. In order to move more closer to some form of general AI, also some core things that actually need to be done. And a lot of people say is that what OpenAI set out to do, and it's that I should focus on more. So their next step, OpenAI is really uh, on the um, cooperative play where, you, where humans and AIs play together. And uh, building more concepts or techniques around that. At least that's what they're saying, what I want to explore. Um, on basically how to build assistance, uh, AI bot assistance to, to humans in order to perform better. Okay. Let's have a hand for our speaker. <laughs> so we still have some time so we can discuss things related to this. What do you think? Uh, one thing that I think is uh, still pretty much missing is uh, 
a good connection between, uh, like uh, Marcus said, between the long-term modeling and the short-term. So they're, they're doing things in the action head. They're doing some things in the LSTM, but it's not really, not very well designed. It's sort of like they just put it all over the place and see what works. Yeah. So, and then the way that they're training, it doesn't seem that like they're really treating the trajectory or any particular parts of that, uh, any being specific. So, I mean, in some cases, when, when a particular action happens, the, the state changes a lot, right? Like, say, a spell's cast or a hero dies or something like that. Uh, they're using an important sampling, I guess, to get, get a part of that, right, when it's off the policy. But um, I don't know. Um, is there is there a better type of integration that can be done between long and short term? And to know that when, when the value shifts a lot, that they should pay more attention to that. Right now, because of PPO, they're just doing clipping, which seems like really stupid in some ways, right? You say the hero dies, but I can't change my policy enough, right? I mean, if some, some key actor dies, then you should change your strategy from a, a attack to a defense or from a defense to attack. But PPO may not let you do something like that, right? It only lets you to do gradual changes to your environment, right? So uh, I have a problem with it's that. So creeping the same. So yeah, it doesn't do anything smarter than. Yeah, I mean, they've they've done a lot of things like we would in NLP, which is like trade trade smarts for compute, right? So you make the model simpler, you can run more cycles, you can get your parameters better, uh, but you don't really put a lot of thought a priori into your model, just eat up carbon footprint to to train your model. The other thing that relates to that is, but it's not very well explained, is how to actually the LSTM intersects with the PPO. Because a lot of it is, even, even for this, how much does, let's say, if a hero dies, affect uh, the rewards or the, uh, or the enemies you actually get? Because all the rewards are modeled the handcraft. Do we, are there actually any rewards that are being learned by itself? So that, that have, have not been modeled that, that uh, the AI can actually utilize to, to do something different that humans usually can do. Yeah, I guess that's not clear. I, I guess they could split heads and then say, well, I don't know what this reward is supposed to do, but it's seeming to do something interesting and try to track it down. There. I mean, in their videos, did they, they say anything about, um, you know, interesting things that were learned by the AI that weren't uh, human strategies? Because I know in the StarCraft replays, they were talking about that a lot. Like, what, what type of strategies were actually learned that, um, that humans couldn't do um, by themselves? I remember one of them because uh, there was a lot of criticisms about what the AI did learn how to do, which was not helpful. Like. It can like uh, do a lot of micro, meaning move uh, units very particularly, and and use the fact that it's very good at placing units uh, wherever it wants, right? And the whole over the map, all over the map. Yeah. So, so it has its attention control. everywhere, yeah. right? So it's basically omni, omni omnipotent, right? You can just decide, okay, even though I'm not on the screen, I'm going to move this guy, yeah. there, right? Uh, even though it's not my field of view. But one thing that I remember that they said in StarCraft that the system learned how to do that human players didn't know how to do was um, uh, resource mining. So in StarCraft, you're supposed to assign a certain number of workers to mine resources. And um, the AI assigned a lot of additional workers that uh, the human players wouldn't have done. And then uh, I remember them saying, because I did play a bit of StarCraft, I'm not very good, but I do play it. Uh, when I have free time, is that an oxymoron? Uh, <laughs> But uh, it said that uh, it did that so that when it creates a new base, which needs resource gathering, it can transfer all the extra workers right away instead of needing to build them up. So uh, they, they were able to back rationalize why the agent overbuilds uh, workers to gather resources. So that was, I think, one of the, the, the key findings that, uh, that the AI agent learned that the human players don't think. I don't know if that strategy actually kind of like 
spill into like real world players? Like, did anyone adopt that strategy after that? I'm not quite sure if that was actually adopted. I don't know. Yeah, because they are kind of reluctant to kind of build a lot more workers, right? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know whether I I know in 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 Go and chess now, people refer a lot to how uh, you know uh, uh, computer agents play, right? To to understand how all of those moves are. Good. I remember that when they reported on the 2017 challenge one versus one, they discussed a bit how the bot actually managed to defeat kind of what things they did with them. But I don't remember that they did it for the five versus five. For five versus five, five the, the, emphasis, the emphasis was more on which strategy, which human strategies they actually learned. Didn't see anything on the vision benchmarks. This was another one. This we, we actually covered. Oh, yeah, uh, it says that yeah, uh, I think the AI keep buying back the heroes. Oh, right. Yeah, when you die, you just keep buying back. So maybe we need to explain what buyback means. Oh, <laughs> when, when the hero die, like, there's they usually like this time, they, they can't use it for fix. I think so. Oh, they can't use it for any seconds. Yeah, they can use it for fix, like, depending on the level, right? And then like, you can pay gold to kind of revive you instantly. So I think like the agent keep doing that. Uh, but human like players usually would just that, kind of right? wait. They just yeah. wait it out. Yeah, they just wait it like. And that, like I'm trying to connect the, the types of how, how the agent was learning that type of behavior, whether it's through the LSTM or the rollbacks or. My bet was explicitly modeled. Right? Yeah, oh. it's an action head, right? Exactly. They, they actually have it in, in one of the actions that you can do as a hero, right? Yeah. Is to decide to buy back yourself, right? In, in, in the, 2048 head uh, element LSTM. So, like, to answer that, like maybe we need to look at some additional scores. Like at the end of the game, if a human was playing, like how much gold or whatever points you would be left with, and how much gold coin whatever or the robot would be left with. Right. It would also depend on that. Probably humans like think of more in the long term, so they. I would say her as much as possible. But simply saying, like, what do you want to be able to I know he would answer to that question. Right. So you're saying the final state reward also has to take into account excess resources that were not utilized, right? Maybe, yeah. Yeah. I think when the game, I, at least for one of the game, like, like, I think the AI didn't really have as much reward as the human. But then it suddenly, like, Start predicting like even though you have lesser uh, lesser resources, and you just start predicting that it's gonna win by ninety percent. And then like commenter was just like, what, what's going on? Why is the AI predicting it's gonna win? And then suddenly it actually just rushed in a, in the middle lane, and then it won. And that was quite crazy. So like like they don't really <laughs> they didn't really win with more resources, but yeah, because because that's what everyone was saying. Like it's like usually you know with, with more resources, you're like like a higher likelihood to win. But apparently that's not true because the AI just kind of. <laughs> kind of win them there, yeah, on them. So it's quite like easy. So I was also curious, like when you said, like they tried to do some sort of innovation learning, like concentrating the like, exploration space. Like I was wondering, like how did they actually do it? Like by somehow constraining the data or like, constraining some of the movements. Mm -hmm. But by right. Um, the visibility is one of the things that they should constrain. So not the entire state space is available, but only the, the state space in the near environment is actually visible. So that they have to move to explore the other states. Mm -hmm. And initially the training was done with the full visibility. Yeah. But only um, later on they, they started to, uh, to get the higher importance. And, and the other thing that when they constrained it artificially, that was actually StarCraft 2. StarCraft 2 has a, a, a constraint, I think, in how fast a bot can uh, uh, can um, get trick on action? Yeah, the action for me. Yeah, in, in order to uh, not be um, basically too much faster than humans, because they see they see all the values from the API. By in Dota, in the OpenAI version, they have no such constraints. Inside. The only constraints they have is they see only every four frames. So if they see every frame 
I'm not sure whether that would make them faster or just just too much of a computing situation. They see it with four frames, but that means they also can kind of tune like action every four frames. Yeah, so they only process every four frames. Oh, okay. Yeah. And they, they take the 20,000 values in and they give a guidance of, with eight values of what should be done. Oh, which is controlled by eight values. And wait, let's see whether I can find it here. There's actually the website, uh, the blog post, where they actually visualize the state space, which is left, my laptop. Type. Yeah, no depth control. No. Yeah, sorry, no control. Yeah. Any slides? Yeah. So here they actually have a visualization of uh, of, 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 of what is being seen. They choose different uh, scenes in the back scene. And now they're, so they're visualizing the values uh, that are actually being fed to the bot and then how the particular decision is being made and what values are actually being taken into account. So what uh, different actions and then can uh, get um, so each at each point in time there are about a thousand different actions that can be uh, set out. So you can move, move, move back, store, uh, the, the policy, the rest of the area. Okay, we do frames, three times, okay, so they actually can decide okay. yeah, whether they want to do it now or whether they want to do it in a, a bit later. So they think, they're thinking, so because they're only seeing in the four frame. Yeah. So they're they are getting they're actually making decisions for the next four frames. But, uh, so, so they can make like with all action with, before they see the next observation, yeah. they can make it yeah. within the So they're basically predicting four steps. Oh right. Yeah. So so they see observation, they make like four actions mm -hmm. and then the next observation. Yeah. Also in there. They're predicting a sequence of four actions every frame. Every I'm not, I'm not frame. sure whether they can have to choose one of those or whether they can do for each of them. I'm not sure. Right. That's how they actually see. I guess, I guess they get to pick the action, 
uh, and then decide which, uh, like, like uh, the next four frame before the next observation, which which uh, which frame do they want to kind of make the action? Right. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, they all have like edit four frames. And this scenario is only what's in the actual scope, so within, within the area. That's from, I think that's the June 2018 version. This, this, this is the old version? Yeah. Yeah, this is June, June 2015. No. So that's before the August competition last year. So that's when they just started to work. That's the mostly that blog post about the system that actually released last month. Simply that these games are also actions in those quick suggestions because if you do the map, if you turn off the red 30 frames per second, mm -hmm. then like one frame is coming after like every 33 milliseconds. So I don't think that humans can act like twice within 33 seconds or six, sorry, 33 milliseconds, yeah. 66 milliseconds. Mm -hmm. But they have given this resolution so that you know, the agent can do fun. It has a finer resolution of action, right? It is, I read somewhere that it takes the bot about 80 milliseconds for an action, which is faster than, than what uh, an action needs to You mean the reaction time between yeah. something happening yeah. and So once they finish the computer, what they should be doing next? I want to go over one other piece of work. Um, this is an iClear paper from 2018 from them, um, and they talk about uh, competitive multi-agent environments and training um, multi-agent competition. So um, this is a good, I think, a good paper to to overview what Marcus went over on the PPO, right? So here's the PPO, so we can read this uh, and get a, a compressed version of what Marcus said, right? So, the algorithm alternates between sampling multiple trajectories from the policy, right, which is standard, and performing several efforts of SGD uh, to optimize that. This the state value function is also simultaneously approximated. The error for the value function approximation is also added to the circuit objective. Um, so I think what, what they're talking about in this paper is uh, training, I think it's a little bit different from what they're doing in OpenAI 5, which is that they're explicitly training uh, a, a competitor directly into uh, Space. So they actually have a blog post on that on the OpenAI one, okay. where they have a lot of uh, action standards that are um, in the environment, where they do kind of wrestling. Mm -hmm. So they uh, model two players in uh, one versus one competitive sports. Yeah, so how someone attacks or how someone defends. Mm -hmm. 
mm -hmm. and uh, how we can try to have trick moves uh, that someone falls over when you play the duck and things like this. That uh, if they actually try to model it in the mind. Right. Yeah. So I think, I think in the current model, they're not doing that, right? In the architectures that we've seen today, they're just modeling themselves. They don't have a, a model based idea of what the what the opponent's five characters are doing, right? They just have what I should be doing as, as part of the, the model. I mean, there's that one diagram where they have the blue, blue tiles to say that they, they, they have units, right? Yeah. So the hero modeling is done there, but it's not explicitly being uh, modeled beyond that, I think. Right? It has to be done in the LSDM. Yeah. yeah. So actually, they don't have any details on how they actually use PPO right. in uh, an old, uh, old run. They just say they use the same environment. Mm -hmm. But I haven't seen anything. Focus on both details. That's actually quite interesting how they link to the guy. Yeah, so I guess they're looking into that at, at this point. Maybe you see the limitations that they're incorporating this, this type of um, competitive agent modeling directly into I'm not sure if I misunderstood, but I think you were saying like uh, one human was also playing with other like four bots. Yeah, so they just released this uh, literally uh, five days ago. That's what's going to have uh, start tonight. So they have three bots. So they did a few uh, demos on Sunday. Saturday last, uh, last, last Saturday, we had three bots played with two humans against the other three bots with two humans. So in that case, how are these players uh, like communicating with each other? Like I, I guess like when humans are playing, suppose someone says attack from the left, that means something. In this case, how would they communicate to the bot? Yeah. How they talk to the bot? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the basically, basically the, the only way would be what they observe, what they do. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think they have a dialogue. <laughs> 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 yeah. Yeah. So they right? Yeah. The human has kind of a simplex channel. Like he or she doesn't have anything to receive. Yeah. Other yeah. than the screens, maybe. Yeah, the human is doing the same thing as in the machines, right? The human is just observing the state of the game without being able to explicitly communicate, right? I mean, in, in both of these games, like Dota as well as StarCraft, you can actually talk right, through chat, and you can also indicate um, on the map what uh, attention area you can say, everyone attack here, and then mark a section of that map. So the all they released is this bit here, so they showcase how those two guys play those two guys, the three bots that in each of them. So they so, say the five versus five. So they have already played once, right? Like, they have, like this, because the, the, the person is saying that, like, um, the yeah, so. Saying that they, 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 they make it feel like <laughs> they are the king of the game or something. They gave, the gave the, the, the ball gave his life up. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yes. So he he is one top professional gamer who's actually working with them. Oh, okay. Since um, um and he commentates usually those uh international competitions. Uh, so he he's internally been uh, helping them and even when they did internal competitions he helped them to, to get the, uh, the knowledge how professional gamers approach the game. The others, he is from one of the top teams. The others, I, I haven't seen him so far. The Viper gave his life up for me. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess, like, <laughs> maybe the boss are playing a more supportive role. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he's sacrificing himself. <laughs> In some ways, that tells you about the architecture of the game is actually somewhat cool. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, the RL agent wouldn't have learned that if, if it's uh, a better optimal strategy to be selfish, yeah. right? Yeah. So that means the game has been architected, um, I why guess, in an they... optimal way to, to favor cooperation of a certain sort. But it's like, why would the RL agent think that a human, uh, that it dying would be better than a human dying? You know? <laughs> why, why don't you just think that, oh, maybe I can play better than a human because I got so much action for me, <laughs> and then decided to, okay, that you might just like fight. Well, something. he doesn't know it's a human, right? He just thinks it's another bot. So he oh, says, yeah. uh, this other yeah. agent yeah. probably is in a better position maybe to use my help. And the human will not sacrifice for it. <laughs> <laughs> so someone has to sacrifice and he decided to, <laughs> to be the one. <laughs> yeah, we see that all the time, right? <laughs> 
they, they say a lot of these autonomous agents that are delivering food are getting vandalized and kicked you know, because uh, yeah humans don't care about robots right but you wouldn't do that to a pizza delivery guy right yeah, but you would do it to a robot just because uh, there's no one watching <laughs> <laughs> like the human can tell the agent to go to the left. <laughs> yeah, what yeah. if like if they all rush to the center? So that like right? summarizing the action the agent is taking. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's the how fast is that psychology? Yeah, it's it's actually, actually no better <laughs> things. <laughs> <laughs> What's what what the psychology? No wonder. Yeah, yeah. 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 Probably, probably, probably with us. But your your vocabulary wouldn't have. Very much, you know, left, right, half, down. I, I think they have to because it's like, like, because, because, okay, there's three lanes, right? First of all, the agent needs to know like, which lane is going, right? Because if they all go to the center lane at the start, then then the both lane is just, is, yeah. it's just left on the end. Okay, on that one, I actually read that um, the open AI, the way they train, each um, bot when they train, they are assigned a preferred lane, oh. which they actually use to train. So yeah. they actually discipline them, but they, they, oh, they, they don't do that. And that's, that's fine, brothers. So they all assign you could take this lane, you take this, you take this. So they turn up their, their level faster so, and that they cover all the lanes. So, so I, yeah. I read that they're that starting for it. Oh, so they already have this preference for a certain lane. Yeah. They always go yeah. to that lane. Okay. Mm. That's their bootstrapping, right? <laughs> In some sense, you're, you're, oh, man, you're adding, putting that, some prior. Yeah, they're, very, they're emphasizing very much that they don't do bootstrapping. Uh, yeah, <laughs> not data bootstrapping. <laughs> prior art. Yeah, I mean, all bootstrapping like, not in a statistical sense, yeah. right? Bootstrapping in the sense that you have prior knowledge of what yeah, to yeah. protect and what not to protect, right? And how to distribute your resources. So they still haven't been able to learn that strategic knowledge, right? They're sort of imbuing the system with some preferences that would be beforehand. Or hard constraints, it sounds like Marcus was saying, or hard constraints. Like you have to you have to assign at least one bot to each lane or yeah, something like that. Yeah, there's no way you can just let them one bot because then there's definitely going to be lanes that, you know, there's left on men and then people are just going to support that. Yeah. Actually, I would say the low here is that they change something in order to make that work. So so if I have a strong boss trained to have all heroes controlled by copies of itself to generate and then generalize to control subsets. So now the three heroes itself can play with others. So they're playing with or against humans. So which basically uh, implies that before when the five bots play together, there is kind of something like a controller that again try to basically coordinate. So that's how I read it. That's not, what I, I, that's not what I read. I don't feel that there's still a controller. It's just saying that um, the, the agent, there are copies of the agent running running each of the their characters, right? But if it would be completely independent, there would be no need to actually have anything change that will replace a bot of you. Because then the input would just come from you, not from the bot. The data looks the same. Right. I don't know exactly what they mean by zero shot transfer. <laughs> that's, that's, <laughs> well, what do they mean by? <laughs> the what, what the not, we cannot understand <laughs> what the sentence is trying. I mean, I know what zero shot transfer cool. learning is, but what 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 zero zero <laughs> shot transfer learning? <laughs> what what does one shot count here? I mean, uh, it means an observation, right? So you, you need to know, mm. meaning you never observe, um, you know, so, playing with this player before, is it? So uh, if you know suddenly I play Dota with uh, four AI, it counts as zero shot learning because they've never seen me play before. So it's gen gen generalizing it. But like we Sun says, uh, you know, it's sort of I would guess assuming that I would play optimally like them, right? Because I would have to play like what they experience. Uh, but if I don't, then that counts as zero shot because I'm playing suboptimally, right? Because yeah. I'm playing like a, a poor losing human, right? Rather than a, <laughs> rather than a, a Dota open AI agent. And like, the impression from all these blog posts are just that like, like they, they, they put all these words in and then, and then ultimately they, they hide a lot of details on the implementation. They are not sharing that, that details and it's, it's really open for a lot of inter uh, interpretation like, like what they're actually trying to say when they say surgical and all this sort of. Yeah, I guess you, you, you try your best as a machine learning researcher to read between the 
lines. Right? <laughs> <laughs> For some marketing person who matches up like a ten. <laughs> so you see, you can go at, and play over the next two days. I and try to reverse engineer <laughs> these type of policy decisions, right? Yeah, yeah. So you can design a natural experiment, okay? If the LSTM is supposed to do this, it should behave this way when I play like that, right? I really want to want to see like what the pro really thinks about this AI, like 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 the profession of it, like their yeah, honest opinion. <laughs> on it. One one thing they actually shared after they released the one on one in two thousand seventeen, a lot of pros actually used the one on one to train themselves. Oh yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. In one on one game, because they actually said this, the speed at which uh, the uh, the bot was taking decisions, they just got overwhelmed. And now most of the pros are trained up to actually play the one-on-one. -on -one. They have a, mm -hmm. have a shot against that. Speed. So the speed and the accuracy is something that they, that they uh, actually got out of that. There's a, I think there's a blog post on that one. Which means that there's there some per minute that they're, they're, they're actually yeah. kind of training it for. So let's say like the grandmasters or the, the, the top level human players now have somebody higher ranked for them to compete against, right? Yeah. Because they can outperform them in terms of competition. Actually, per minute. That, yeah, <laughs> APM counts. Yeah. Even the StarCraft too, like it was the mean action per minute that was kept. So I, I think it spiked. Like whenever cru a crucial moment it goes up to like a thousand. And then after that, like on non crucial moment it just goes back down. Yeah. So on average it's kept. <laughs> but there, there's no like hard limit, like uh, actually on like per per minute, like how much you can do. So it, it does spike up quite a bit. Yeah. I think most of those comments are actually in the videos when they talk. So they show the games and they talk to the guys. Oh, yeah, they actually get faster than the bot. Yeah, this 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 is the professional oh. player. From the form of world champion. Yeah, so I think we're going to call it uh, a class. Thank you all for uh, participating in uh, the class and the uh, had fun. Uh, we still don't know who won the Steps Award last night because <laughs> the Steps Award crashed. Oh, oh. <laughs> oh yeah, it was not so good. Uh, but uh, Anan says that they have all the counts, so I guess okay. we'll hear it soon. So uh, uh, we only had four posters, so uh, <laughs> I think I told Anan just uh, award one team. So, yeah, uh, I thought we would be seated. <laughs> yeah. Otherwise, yeah. You know, we will have enough uh, credits to go around to to <laughs> buy up more carbon footprints for GPU training. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so let's thank uh, Marcus once again. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> 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 They're doing all the casts. Yeah.